All right, gang, here we go. Uh, this is for my Chem 2 class, right? Uh, this is the beginning of Unit 2. We're talking about Chapter 2. Specifically, we're going to talk about the history of Adam and the um, things that are the experiments that went into helping us to cover, discover uh, atoms and subatomic particles and so on and so forth. A little bit more, but that's about it. All right, so um, this comes from Brown and LeMay. Uh, Burston Murphy Woodard, uh, Stolf, uh, sorry about that. But anyway, 14th edition of their textbook. Okay. All right, here we go. So, atomic theory of matter. When did it all start? Um, really, the earliest we have record of the discovery of atoms, or at least the third, the first thought of atoms is from Greek philosophers, specifically Democritus. And they hypothesized, or they thought that uh, there might be some smallest particle that they referred to as atomos. Atomos in Greek meant uncuttable. So that means it's a, a smallest particle that you can't cut any smaller. Okay, so that's where we get the word atom. Okay, um, and so that was, you know, a long time ago and then several thousand years later in the 1800s uh, John Dalton came around and he started to organize what he called his atomic theory and the atomic theory was really made up of these three uh, concept these three components okay um, and these three components really allowed him to determine uh, the four postulates of his atomic theory okay so the first is the law of constant composition okay we talked about this in the last unit Okay. Uh, essentially, that compounds have def definite composition. That means that the relative number of atoms of each element in the compound is the same in any sample. So that if you have a cup of water, okay, right, then you've got water in here. And we just kind of assume it's H2O. We take that for granted. But they didn't really know that at the time. So he hypothesized his spot that because it's the same thing if you have two cups of water that if you have water in this cup the water in this cup is going to be the same as the water in that cup and therefore they have to have the same relative number of atoms now to us that just makes complete sense right because we've got h2o here so that means we've got h2o there okay this law was discovered and proved by joseph proust all right so he's the one that kind of came up with the law of composition and so this was the one of the important laws that john dalton based his atomic theory on uh, the second is the law of conservation of mass, okay? Essentially, that mass uh, can't be created or destroyed is really the general thing, or at least it can't be uh, changed during a chemical process, all right? Now, obviously, uh, you know, with nuclear chemistry and so on and so forth, we know mass can be created or destroyed, but um, it changes into energy and back and forth. But in a chemical, purely chemical reaction, chemical process, the masses of the products versus the reactants should remain the same. Uh, they can change how they're bonded, they can change the states they're in, but essentially they need the mass of the total masses of the products need to equal the total mass of the reactants, um, and so on and so forth. This was discovered by Antoine Lavoisier, okay? Um, and it was a yet again another law that Dalton used, all right? Last law, Dalton actually discovered himself, okay? And he says that if two elements, A and B, form more than one compound, the masses of B that combine with a given mass of A are in ratio of small whole numbers. Okay, so essentially he's just saying, all right, if you have A and B and you're going to stick those guys together, they all have to go in a ratio of small whole numbers. All right, so essentially you can't have like H1.20. Okay, it's got always got to be a small, a small whole number, C2 or C2O. That's not a thing, CO2, right? All right, so um, when two or more compounds exist of the same elements, they cannot have the same relative number of atoms. Okay, all right, so postulates. So, this, so he took those three ideas, those three laws, and turn, turned them into his atomic theory. Okay, so his first postulate is that each element is composed of extremely small particles. Okay. So you've got an atom of elemental oxygen and an atom of elemental nitrogen, okay? And he called these atoms, and he used the Greek word atomos to name them, all right? So that's the first postulate. Second is that all atoms of a given element are identical to one another in mass and properties, okay? So if you've got a bunch of oxygens together, okay, they're each going to have identical mass, and they're going to have identical properties, 
okay? But they're gonna be different than the other elements. So if you've got oxygen, you compare it to nitrogen, they should have different mass and different properties, okay? And that's how you can distinguish what's one element versus another, okay? Uh, number three, atoms of one element cannot be changed into atoms of another element by chemical reactions. So if you start with oxygen, you can't turn it into nitrogen using a chemical reaction. All right. And then finally, number four, compounds or atoms of more than one element combine to form compounds. Right. So if you take two different elements, in this case we're talking about nitrogen and oxygen, and we form nitrogen monoxide, okay? and they always have the same relative number and kind of atoms. All right, so those are four postulates. I don't expect you to memorize them, but you should definitely be familiar with them. All right, now the discovery of the subatomic particles, okay? So in Dalton's view, he said it was the smallest particle possible, okay? He didn't have any idea about any of the subatomic particles, you know, proton, neutron, and electron, okay? And then even past that, you know, we now know more about quarks and the other sub subatomic particles. Okay, uh, so we're going to talk about each of the experiments that help us prove and discover the properties of these different things. All right. So first up that was found was electrons, and this was, um, you know, he proved the existence of these things called electrons. Um, this guy named J. J. Thompson. He did this in 1897. Okay, so he took what's called a cathode ray. Okay, so a, or a cathode ray tube, so it's essentially a glass tube, and the only thing that you have in it is whatever kind of gas you're looking at. Okay, so um, maybe during class we'll bust out some of our cathode rays, um, if you remind me to get those out. All right, so we can look at these. We can hook them up to uh, an, uh, an electric charge, right? So we go, so we've got an electric current traveling through this, and that's what this beam is. Is this electron beam traveling through it? Now, they referred to these as cathode rays at the time, but really they were just electrons, and they move from the negative cathode to the anode, okay? And so they're going along this way, all right? And then he would take a magnet, and he noticed as he brought a magnet in there that he noticed that his the electron beam or the cathode rays would start to bend in relation to the magnet, okay? So the magnet could bend the rays either towards or away from the magnet, depending on if he used the positive or negative end of the magnet. All right, so that proved that electrons existed, that there was some sort of negatively charged something okay, uh, that would transfer across, and they would get moved by the magnets. All right, so upon further examination, we've got you know, we can really start to get an idea of the electron. So in this setup here, we've got um, an electron electron beam here, cathode ray going through, um, and there's the anode shoving it through, okay? Then we set up two electrically charged plates, okay? That's important, all right? And then you've got a magnetic field as well with the north and south pole, all right? Then um, you've got a fluorescent screen at the end. Now, because of the fluorescent screen, you can see where it's hitting on the screen. As soon as it gets bent, the light will bend and you'll be able to see it move and hit a different spot on the screen. This is essentially how old school CRT TVs worked, or CRT monitors. They would be have an evacuated tube, you'd send the electrons through and then you'd have some sort of a fluorescent screen at the other end. So when it hit that screen, it would change the, um, it would it'd light up and have it show a picture, and you could try to change what kind of picture it was showing, so on and so forth. Anyway, so the electron tra travels through, and we can use electrons, we can use electricity here to change the magnetic field. Here we can also use this magnet, and so when, it's, when all things are equal, then the, it's right in the middle, but we can also bend it one way or the other, left or right, up or down, to make it, those beams move. Okay, and so because of his, you know, setting up this experiment, kind of like this, he was able to discover the charge to mass ratio. Okay, so he didn't actually discover the actual charge or the actual mass of the electron, but he did discover the charge to mass ratio. So he figured out that for um, every gram, you should have at least 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs of charge. Then there was the Millikan well drops uh, experiment. This was done by Robert Millikan around 1909. And this is really what allowed us to discover the actual charge of the electron. All right, so what he did is he took this, uh, this 
can, can, the canister and then some sort of substance, usually like an oil, okay? Now, they don't show it on this, but this device here has about the coolest name you've ever seen in your entire life. It's called the Atomizer, okay? I'm not even joking. That thing, this is essentially just a squirt bottle. <laughs> it's called the Atomizer. I love it. It's friggin' awesome, all right? But anyway, so he took the Atomizer, he squirted out these oil drops, Squirt, 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 and it would fill up this top part with oil drops that would start to fall, right? Gravity pulls down, so these oil drops would start to fall. And he has a hole, a very tiny hole in this plate right here. And then he charged this plate positively, and he charged this plate negatively. Now, these atoms are neutrally charged originally when they start to come out. So they'd go out, and they'd start to fall through the hole, okay? And then he'd start shooting x-rays right here. He'd shoot x-rays at these oil drops as they fell. And these x-rays, as they hit the oil drops, they would become negatively charged. Now, we know that negative and positive attract each other, right? Opposites attract. So as these oil drops became negatively charged, they got pulled up towards this positive plate. Okay, so these oil drops were starting to fall, but as the they became negatively charged, they'd start to counteract gravity and be dragged upwards. Okay, so as the force of gravity pulled it down, the electric field pulled it up. Okay, and you'd use this microscope to see these electric these oil drops, and you could actually see them go up or down, or stay completely stationary. Okay, now because of this experiment, we were actually able to figure out the charge based on how fast it started to go up and how many X-rays we shot at these particles. Okay, so it was a little bit of complicated math. All right. Finally, radioactivity is when we have a, a, a nucleus and it spontaneously emits high energy radiation. Okay. It was first discovered by Henry Bacquerel, okay. um, and then Mary and Perry Curie also studied it. All right. uh, and these, these three scientists all got, um, are all remembered for their work with nuclear energy um, or nuclear chemistry, and these are the units that are most used to represent nuclear uh, powers, Baccarals and Curies, right? Um, and it showed that the atom has more subatomic particles and energies associated with it. Okay, so essentially we're like, okay, so we've got the electrons. We know about those pretty well. We know their mass. We know their charge. Uh, we know their ratio. Um, but then there's got to be something else going on as well. Okay, so Ernest Rutherford came around, and you know because of the work of the Baccarat and the Curies, uh, they had a pretty good understanding of what produced radiation. Okay, so he set up this experiment here where he put a lead block because they discovered that radiation couldn't pass through lead and he put a radioactive substance in here and so it would shoot out its radioactive uh, particles this way and he set up another lead block probably that had a hole in it that would allow these to pass through in just one specific line. Again, he set up an electric charged plates, and depending on what kind of particles pass through, you could see that it would bend in different ways. So the photographic plate would show up what uh, show what showed up. Okay, so the neutral rays would not get deflected by the positive or negative because they're neutral, and he called these gamma rays. Okay, uh, they're completely uncharged and they were unaffected by the plates. The ones that got bent towards the positive plates, he called the beta rays. Okay, because and they were bent towards the positive, so that means they were negatively charged. Okay, and then the red rays here, he called alpha rays, and they were had to have been positively charged because they were bent downwards towards the negative plate. Okay. Now this video here, download the um, the PowerPoint or get to it on Google Classroom and watch the video and it's a cloud chamber video. It's really interesting to watch. You can actually see radioactive waves uh, being hit, hit into little, uh, to the vapors that are in the cloud chamber there, okay? So, at about 1900, we, were, we had a good idea of the, um, you know, at least that there were positive and negative parts to the atom and the best idea for the atom or the prevailing theory was that uh, the atom was like kind of a roundish ballish shape but the negative electrons um, were kind of like point particles surrounded by like this gunky positive 
peanut butter-esque thing, okay? And so it was J.J. Thompson kind of uh, formulated it, and he just called it the plum pudding model. So he came along and he's like, well, it's like plum pudding. You've got the pudding and then you put plums in it, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and so this was like the prevailing theory until uh, Ernest Rutherford came around, all right? Ernest Rutherford, yes, the same guy as the radioactive things, um, as the radioactive particles. He came around and he developed this experiment here. Now he took uh, his radioactive particles, specifically ones that produced alpha particles, put them in a lead box and let them shoot out at a super thin piece of gold foil, all right? Now the gold foil, now the alpha particles, would come through and he expected them just to go straight through. However, what he what he found was that occasionally the vast majority went through unscathed and would hit exactly where he expected. Okay? But occasionally they would get ricocheted and end up in different places. So we and he could see on his fluorescent screen where they'd hit. Um, and like it was actually very very surprising because it was essentially like the idea of having like shot a bowling ball at a piece of tissue paper and have it bounce right back at you okay and so this was very surprising so it made Ernest Rutherford completely think of a totally different way of formulating what was happening in the atom so he formulated that uh, actually there, the vast majority of the space between atoms was empty and that that's where the electrons resided was around the outside okay but the whatever the protons were the nucleus was a very very dense hard center at the very middle of it and so as the alpha particles came in they would hit the nucleus and then bounce off Okay. And because it was a very dense, massive center point, it was enough to deflect the heavy, high-energy alpha particles as they came through. Okay. And this is what really allowed us to develop the idea of the nucleus. Okay. So he postulated that this was the size, and by doing very precise calculations, he actually was able to give a guesstimate on the size of the atom and the size of the space occupied by electrons. Okay. Um, so it, based on this work is where we were able actually to come up with the idea of protons and then eventually Chadwick came along with uh, formulating, finding the proof of the neutron, okay? So here we go. We've talked about the subatomic particles, okay? Main ones, protons and electrons. Protons have positive charge, electrons have negative charge, and then we have neutrons and they're neutral, okay? Protons and neutrals have a relatively the same mass. We define that as one, and the mass of the electrons, although they do have mass, is so small compared to the new protons and neutrons that we just don't think about it when we talk about the mass of an atom, okay? Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus, electrons are on the outside. Here's a little table for you to analyze. Okay, so the atomic number, a couple of things. We're almost done with this video. Okay, uh, how do we determine which element an atom is? We use the atomic number. So the atomic number tells us what number element we have. Okay, and it's simply the number of protons in the nucleus of atoms. So hydrogen has the atomic number one. There's one proton in the nucleus of hydrogen atom. Tin has an atomic number of 50 and so therefore it has 50 uh, protons in the nucleus of its atom, okay? <clears throat> so, since if you have a neutral atom, I want you to pay attention to this, okay? If you have a neutral atom, that means the number of protons equals the number of electrons, okay? Number of protons equals the number of electrons. That's in a neutral atom. As soon as you start having an ion, life gets more complicated, all right? So this is, uh, this is just basic stuff here, okay? Symbol of an element, so this is carbon, okay? This is the atomic number. It always goes on the bottom left. The atomic number is down here. And the top right, top left, excuse me, is the mass number. The mass number is the number of protons it has plus the number of neutrons. So we know that in this carbon atom, there are six protons and six neutrons, okay? <clears throat> Uh, now remember, for the, every element, the first letter is always capitalized, and the second letter is always lowercase. Okay, all atoms of the same element have the same number of protons, which is called the atomic number, and is written as subscript before. Okay, the mass number is up above. Now the trick is that you can actually have different mass numbers for the same element. So there's carbon 12, carbon 11, carbon 13, okay, and even some carbon 14. 
okay? And we call these isotopes. Okay, so isotopes are the same element. They have the same number of protons, right? Notice how we've got different isotopes of carbon down here, and each of them have six protons right here. Each, each of them have six protons, okay? And they've all got six electrons because they're neutral atoms. They are not ions, okay? So they've all got the same number of electrons as protons, but notice that the number of neutrons is different, okay? For carbon-11, okay? carbon 11 the number of neutrons is 5 okay 6 plus 5 is 11 for carbon 12 the, there's 6 neutrons 6 plus 6 is 12 and then for carbon 13 6 plus 7 is 13 6 plus 8 is 14 okay these are isotopes so isotopes are when we have the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons Okay, and that's about as far as we're going to get in today's video, all right? So this is the first little bit of chapter two, and or the first little bit of unit two, most of chapter two we just talked about very quickly. It's Most of it is review from Chem 1. Uh, good luck. Let me know if you have any questions.